Uh, next up, we have Jesse and Mike Winch presenting the camera truck project. I've already uh, introduced Jesse. Uh, Mike has been a steward for four years. He's worked on numerous citizen science programs and projects, including the Wildlife Camera Project in its first iteration, uh, Tortoise Telemetry, and Non-Native Plant Invasive Plant Management, among others. Mike is a steward lead for the new Wildlife Camera Project, and we'll talk today about the status of that project as uh, it begins, um, as it launched this spring. So thank you, Mike and Jesse. Thank you so much, Melanie, for that great introduction. Hello again, everybody. Um, so now we're going to switch over to the camera project. Uh, so Mike and I are going to talk a little bit about what camera trapping is, what this uh, new phase of the camera project is all about. Um, it's really exciting stuff. We got some great pictures. So get ready. So first, uh, we're going to give me a second here. My uh, arrows are not working. One moment, please. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with a little bit of an introduction about why this project matters, um, the specific purpose of this new camera project, the details of the study design, what's different between the old and the new one, a timeline of events, uh, where we're at now and where we're going, and then if this is something you're interested in, how you can participate. So um, as we've talked about, right, this, uh, our preserve is an incredibly important protected piece of land that's also connected to the Tonto National Forest and the McDowell Regional Park. That's 3 million acres of, of protected land here. That's also facing these uh, urban stressors, these human stressors, um, encroaching on them. And how is that going to affect our biodiversity into the future? How can we kind of manage our natural resources as time goes on? And so as we're looking at our preserve, we have these uh, increasing in urban development around these edges. We have that main Rio Verde road splitting the north and the south. We have this gooseneck corridor that's bridging the gap between the south part of the preserve and the regional park and the north part of the preserve and the Tonto even farther north. Uh, we have an increase in human activity. So there's more trail use, um, there's more human recreation, there's an increased just number of humans present in the preserve and surrounding areas. There's also increased uh, additional urban stressors such as uh, light pollution or sound pollution that could be affecting wildlife um, in the area. And so we kind of have this, uh, we wanna monitor our wildlife populations over time here to understand how these stressors might be affecting them. And this importance of this long-term monitoring where you're not just taking a look at the species um, one year to the next year, where it could be a dry year, it could be a bad year. What does that mean as a whole, right? So we wanna get these population trends over long periods of time so we can really get at is the population stable? Uh, is it declining? And if it is, why? You know, Could it be some of these, some of these stressors uh, that are exacerbating um, these wildlife populations. And one of the ways that we can uh, monitor wildlife and a lot of different wildlife over time is with camera trapping. So what exactly is camera trapping? So camera trapping is using a uh, trail camera basically to capture or trap wildlife that walks in front of it. So it's a passive survey technique, which means you don't actually have to be present at the site to collect the data. So you can set up the camera and you can leave. And the camera is actually uh, triggered by heat changes you know, in motion. The gentleman who bought the antler ring back in um, 19. So all cracks in it now. Let's see, the camera is actually uh, triggered by heat and uh, motion. So anything walking in front of it will trigger the camera to take a photo. And that's what we would call uh, a capture. And so lots of different wildlife can be captured this way. Um, anything that's walking around on the ground. So you think of your mammals such as bobcats, coyotes, mountain lions, you know, gray fox, badger, skunk, all those really cool mammals. You can also get really good data on quail and roadrunners as well. Uh, anything that's kind of walking around in front enough to where we can collect enough data. You'll also get wildlife like hummingbirds will fly in front of the cameras, uh, lizards will scurry by, um, but the stuff that's kind of um, around walking around will get uh, good enough data to make some um, conclusions on these populations and the community as a whole. Um, there are some trade-offs to um, surveying with wildlife cameras. So uh, like I was mentioning before, you don't actually have to be present at the site to collect the data. And that allows you to collect a lot more data at a lot more sites. And the more sites that you have, the more um, 
the wider distribution you can capture, the more data that you can have, the stronger statistical conclusions you can make. So that's really awesome. That doesn't mean that's more data that you have to go through on the back end as well. Um, so we get uh, tens of thousands of photos at each of these sites um, to go through, but thankfully we have a really good army of volunteers that are just ready and willing to go through photos for us um, and contribute to the study. And the other kind of interesting um, trade-off that we have with cameras specifically to the Sonoran Desert or the desert uh, desert areas is that because the camera is heat and motion triggered, the sun can heat up vegetation and when vegetation moves, it will also set off the camera. So you can get really, you can drown in photos of vegetation. And so we have to do a lot of mitigation to try and reduce the amount of false triggers that we have using those cameras. And um, this photo here to the right is a setup of one of our wildlife cameras. If you're having trouble seeing the wildlife camera, that's great because that means we're camouflaging it really well. Uh, here's that security box. The camera is inside of it. It has these um, the motion sensors at the top. And then we have a cable lock around the uh, tree to keep it in place. And those are um, installed permanently there. And um, so the purpose of this project, uh, like we were talking about earlier, is long-term monitoring of ground dwelling vertebrates. And what I mean by long-term is 10, 20, 30 years indefinitely, whatever we need to get data on the population trends of, of these animals. And uh, like I talked about in the last slide, ground dwelling just means anything walking in front of the uh, in front of the camera, such as uh, mammals or those birds. We talked about the quail or the roadrunner. So we want to monitor these populations long term, as well as the, the community as a whole. And the reason that we do that is we can detect trends. We can detect changes, particularly declines. So we can see if a wildlife population is declining over time or if there's a reduction in the number of species at sites in the ex exterior um, versus the interior of the preserve, for example. And then once we've identified those changes, we can um, relate it to uh, what caused those changes, right? Was it a natural factors such as temperature or precipitation? Was it anthropogenic factors or human factors such as increase in urbanization, uh, density of trail use, uh, distance to road or distance to trail? Uh, urban noise, like what are these factors that might be causing um, those population changes? And then once we have that information, we can make recommendations for managing and conserving wildlife. So if urban noise is an issue or light pollution is an issue or distance to road is an issue, we might be able to have a conversation about whether or not to expand the road or to create a wildlife crossing. So those kind of specific uh, causations to our populations will allow us to make better recommendations for conserving our species in the future. And then, of course, as with all of our projects, we want to engage to educate the public. So we want them to understand the importance of having a healthy ecosystem. You know, it's kind of like ecology Django, where if you take out one species, you know, your tower might be okay, but if you keep taking them out, um, the whole entire ecosystem will suffer. So we really want to maintain that biodiversity, maintain a healthy population, and that will help not only the preserve, but also the connected landscape we're a part of, and also, you know, uh, the Sonoran Desert as a whole. And so we want people to understand that. Um, and engage them in, in these projects that we're doing. So there are several key differences between this project and our prior projects. One is scope and size. In the prior projects, we were focused on the corridor connecting the south to the regional park, to the north and to the Tonto. In this project, we're gonna survey the entire preserve. And we're interested in the entire preserve because it's not homogenous. You know, what's happening on a border, for example, an urban border may not be what's happening on the border between the Tonto and the preserve or what's happening inside in the interior of the preserve. The other thing that a larger uh, survey in the entire preserve does is it gives us a larger distribution and a larger sample size, which better enables us to answer our research questions. Now, past projects, we had cameras deployed uh, throughout the year. In this project, we'll have a seasonal deployment with cameras deployed September and October, and then again, March through May. And you might say, well, are you going to miss something by doing a seasonal deployment? Well, we've leveraged the, the previous studies that we've done, and they've informed us that we will have a suitable distribution of data with this seasonal deployment. And those of you that have participated in the camera project in the past know that when you're strapping a camera box to a tree and then servicing that camera, sometimes it's really difficult to get the camera back in the same position that it was before. We're virtually eliminating that in this project because it is long-term with permanent installation of the camera security boxes. 
And then lastly, another key difference is camera placement. We're specifically looking for the animal travel ways, the washes, the game trails, the human trails that the animals are using and then placing cameras with to, to increase the odds that we're going to capture all of the wildlife that's living in that particular area. We're following a standardized protocol, and that's important for a couple of reasons. One, the protocol we're following has been developed by camera trap experts over the years. It's field tested and field proven. And by doing so, we don't have to spend our energy and resources developing our own protocol. Secondly, by following the standardized protocol, we can share and compare our data to other studies that have used the same protocol. And then lastly, if we decide to publish our data, we expect that we would have fewer challenges because we're following such a rigorous standardized protocol. We're gonna have a minimum of 60 wildlife camera sites with 30 cameras deployed at any one point in time. And then when the cameras are deployed, we'll deploy for a month long survey at each one of those sites, as I said earlier, in the spring and the fall seasons of the year. The fall uh, deployments will support an effort called Snapshot USA. Snapshot USA is a nationwide uh, effort to collect as many different sites and as many different photos of, of animals in the fall every year. And in this way, the Conservancy then is supporting something greater uh, than our preserve. In this case, it's a nationwide effort. So one of the things that's really important in a study like this is independence. In order for our data and our conclusions to be valid, the cameras have to, the camera sites have to be independent from one another. And so we're gonna provide that independence by locating the cameras at least a thousand meters apart. A thousand meters is roughly six tenths of a mile. So what we've done is we've taken a 1500 square meter grid and overlaid it on the preserve. And then in the center, the center point of each one of those grid cells, we've drawn a 500 meters, so roughly a little over a quarter of a mile buffer around each center point. A camera can be placed anywhere within that buffer and it'll be at least a thousand meters from the cameras in the adjacent cells. The buffer sounds kind of large if you think of a quarter mile in diameter, but that provides us a, a, some opportunity and flexibility to select the, camp, the, the game trails to hopefully increase the odds that we'll capture all the wildlife that's living in that area. We, uh, in this diagram, you'll, if you count the dots, I'm not asking you to, but there's 75 of them. Uh, and we've selected 75 potential sites because we expect that we're gonna lose some due to inaccessibility. We've split the sites into two arrays. So when we deploy the cameras, we'll deploy every other cell. So for example, the first deployment will deploy to the red dots here or the red cells here. And then after 30 days, we'll, we'll deploy it to the, the green cells. And in this way, we can support 60 camera sites with 30 cameras. So our timeline looks like this. We're, scouting sites and installing security boxes now, and we're conducting a pilot study, studying the performance of the cameras in our environment, as well as studying some of the sites themselves. For those of you interested in the field work, we intend to have a camera, op a camera operation workshop in August, and those uh, interested in photo sorting, a similar workshop for species identification. Then our first deployments of cameras will occur September, October this year in support of Snapshot USA. We'll deploy cameras to a subset of the sites. And then our first full deployment will be next spring of 60 sites. So there's several ways that you can participate. One is with the field work. Uh, you can participate in the scouting and security box install that we're doing now. You can also participate in the annual camera deployment move and retrieval. And we're gonna need a lot more stewards to support this effort than we have in the past because we have a large number of cameras and the camera density is far less. To give you an example, in the last project, we had 10 cameras in and around the gooseneck. This project will only have four. So that decreased density means it will need more people and more trips because it's longer between the camera sites to go out and service the cameras. And then you can also uh, participate in the photo sorting and species identification. And that participation can be done remotely with a solid internet connection. And again, because we have so many more cameras, meaning we'll have more photos, 
we'll need more people to sort the, the photos. So sometimes it does rain in the Sonoran Desert. This is a photo taken uh, during our productive monsoon season last August. And now we'd like to entertain your questions. All right, uh, one question about servicing the equipment, the camera equipment, how often is that done? So we're gonna have uh, two deployments, one September, October. And so what we would do is deploy early September for 30 days, then move the cameras. Uh, and then in the second deployment, they'd be deployed 30 days and we would pick them up. And then we'd repeat that same cycle in the spring. And another question, do we have problems with equipment failure or theft? And how do you deal with potential theft when you're shiting the cameras? Or is that not a concern? It, it is a concern. It, fortunately, in the past, the only theft we had uh, was a camera that was in the regional park. And somebody actually brought a chainsaw out and sawed the limb off the tree to steal the camera. Uh, we haven't seen theft since then although it's potential now because we're interested in what the humans do to the animals in terms of their usage of the trail. So we have cameras that are right on the trails. So we could see some of that theft now. Do we have equipment failure? Yes, we do. The sun tends to degrade this equipment over time. And so over time, we'll have to replace the cameras because of the degradation. Yeah, and just to add to that, so uh, for the uh, equipment for vandalizing and stealing, we do have some mitigation efforts. So we camouflage the boxes. Uh, we cam we have signs with uh, authorized research and email if people do come across it. And we also have a, a Python lock. And we do our best to conceal it and to deter any sort of vandalism. But at the end of the day, you know, if people are really determined, um, they will try and damage equipment. And then also um, we do keep track of which camera goes at which site. So if we do have equipment failures, failures we'll know uh, which site it's associated with, which camera it's associated with, and that way we can um, quickly remove that camera and replace it if needed. We're hoping though that uh, the Game and Fish recently changed the regulations in Arizona. Uh, it's now no longer legal to use a wildlife camera for hunting animals in Arizona. And they changed that in June of last year because at some of the watering holes, for example, there would be 20 or 30 cameras. So hopefully what that does for us is it, it reduces the value of a wildlife camera, at least to the hunting community. All right, thank you. I believe that would be all of the questions. Thanks, everyone. All right. Well, thank you, Jesse and Mike. That was another wonderful presentation. And uh, we're really looking forward to hearing some of the early results next year.